to be here. Thank you for coming out or watching online and spending your weekend with us. I am so humbled and excited to get to share with you. Let me start off by wishing all the dads a happy Father's Day. Thank you for everything that you do. We love and appreciate you, and we are so glad to celebrate you this weekend. I've been blessed with an amazing father, so this year I'm giving him the best gift I could think of by getting up here and giving him the week off. <laughs> I've spent the last few days watching him enjoy a mini vacation while I do his job. <laughs> I'm not complaining, but he always made it look easy. It turns out this is a lot more work than I expected. <laughs> so I thought, what better way to prepare for my first time speaking on a weekend than to go back and listen to his first message? He's come a long way, but, but how did he get started? But my dad called me Monday night and he said, Joel, are you sitting down? And I thought, oh no, there's gonna be bad news. And I thought maybe it was about his health or something. He said, but I'm gonna ask you something. Don't pass out when I ask you. And I thought, okay, what is it? And he said, will you preach for me Sunday morning? And I thought, boy, that was bad news. <laughs> and I said, but I thought about the advantages of being my first time. One, if I'm really bad and you don't enjoy it, when you walk out of here, you can say, you know, that boy has nowhere to go but up. <laughs> After seeing that, I realized I don't have a country accent <laughs> and I don't have a mullet. <laughs> so in some ways, I think I'm already off to a better start. I guess there's nowhere to go but up. Today, I want to talk about the love of the Father. There are many different ways we can know God. We can know Him as an all-powerful creator who made the universe and sits on a throne surrounded by angels. We can know him as this omnipotent being who parts seas and brings the dead to life. We can know him as a man with a big white beard who sits on a cloud and sounds like Morgan Freeman. <laughs> different people have different ideas of who God is. Some people see him as this distant cosmic being that couldn't possibly be concerned with their lives. Some see him as a holy, unapproachable figure to be feared and reverenced. Others think he's just waiting for them to make a mistake. They know God as someone with a long list of everything they've done wrong. But with Jesus came a new way to know God. Through him, we didn't just receive a savior, we were given a father. When the disciples asked Jesus how they should pray, the very first words he used we're our Father in heaven. Of all the ways he could have told us to relate to God, Jesus said he's our Father first. That's the best understanding we could have of God. One of a loving Father. Someone that's proud of us. Someone that cares. Someone that cheers us on and lifts us when we fall. When we know this, we begin to realize God's not distant. He's not unapproachable. He's not mad at us. He is madly in love with us. Jesus, the Son of God, could have only referred to him as his Father. But when he spoke to people, Jesus would say, your Father. It was important to him that we see God this way. Each time he said this, Jesus was reminding us of the way God feels about us. That he's not just the creator of the universe, but he's your heavenly father. He's your biggest fan. He loves to spend time with you. He gets excited to talk to you. He always has your best interest at heart. Your father is a constant source of strength and protection. He's there to encourage you when you're down and push you forward when you feel like giving up. If he cares for the birds of the air, how much more must he care for you? Maybe you grew up without a father, or he was harsh and dealing with his own struggles. You may have gotten used to him not being there for you, or never being able to measure up, but we can't let who our earthly father wasn't to distort the truth of who our heavenly father is. He may have been difficult to please, but know that God has always been pleased with you. He may have been quick to find fault, but know that God is filled with mercy. He may have been absent, but remember, God has promised to be with you 
always. But some people never see God as proud of them. They're too busy criticizing themselves. They think they're not smart enough. They don't look the right way. They don't have enough talent. They've decided if they don't like themselves, then God couldn't either. They know he loves them, but he couldn't actually like them. They're not as funny as their friends. They're not as gifted as their siblings. They don't have a great career like their neighbor does. He would never want to show them off. Don't be like them. Your heavenly Father is the one who breathed life into you. You've been fearfully and wonderfully made. He's the one who gave you your smile, your personality, your gifts, your uniqueness. Everything about you has been carefully designed into what he calls a masterpiece. When God looks at you, he sees a masterpiece. He's amazed. He is so proud. He can't help but show you off. This is what he said in scripture. Have you seen my servant Job? There is no one like him in all the earth. That's how God feels about you. He calls all the angels around and says, come here, come here. Have you seen my son Brian? There is no one like him. He's amazing. Oh, and have you seen my daughter Joy? She's the best. I'm so proud of her. And the angels say, yes, God, we've seen them. You do this every day. <laughs> but God says, I know. I just, I just can't help it. They're my children. That's the love of our Heavenly Father. When he looks at you, he smiles. He likes your height your ability, your ideas. He's the one who gave them to you. Now don't you dare let what other people have said or your own negative opinion tear down God's masterpiece. No father wants to see their child living defeated and discouraged about who they are. If you were supposed to be any different, your heavenly father would have made you that way. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't leave things out. Let go of comparison. Let go of overly critical attitudes. Know that God is proud of you. And if he not only loves us, but he likes us, then we have permission to like who we are too. One of the first times I spoke here at church, I looked down at the front row and I saw not one, but both of my parents holding up their phones recording video. <laughs> I thought, you guys are the pastors. If anyone can get a higher quality version of this message, it's you two. You don't have to record it on your phone. And on top of that, why are you both recording? You're sitting right next to each other. Can't one of you just send it to the other? It didn't matter. My parents sat on the front row for all three services and recorded them on their phones. Yes, they're the pastors but their parents first. And I know they recorded all those services because they were proud of me. And in the same way, God is proud of you. I imagine he's sitting on the front row of heaven with his phone pointed in your direction. He's cheering you on. He's celebrating every step that you take. He wants to remember every little triumph in your life. You're so important to him, he doesn't want to miss a moment. Yes, he's God, but he's your father first. He could have a whole camera crew of angels on the scene, but he just can't help but do it himself. He's been looking forward to the day you were born. He couldn't wait to see you take your first steps. He was so proud when you graduated college, and he is so excited about the things he has planned for your future. Psalm 103 says, as parents feel for their children, so God feels for those who fear him. What's your image of God? Do you see him as your heavenly father? Can you picture him on the front row with his phone pointed toward you? He's not replaying your mistakes. He doesn't hold on to those. His camera roll is filled with love for you. When we have the right image of God, it gives us boldness. We can walk in confidence. It allows us to pursue our dreams and even overcome challenges. If the creator of the universe is for us, there is nothing that could stand against us. I've heard some people ask my dad to pray for them because they think he's closer to God than they are. 
They think maybe if a pastor prays, then God will listen. He's always happy to pray with them, but my dad reminds them, you don't need to go through a third party to talk to your Heavenly Father. You're as much a child of God as anyone else. You don't need a pastor, a priest, or a saint to connect your call. When he sees it's you on the line, God picks up right away. He won't put you on hold. It doesn't go to voicemail. As his son or daughter, you have priority access to your father. But some people don't want to bother God. They see prayer as a last resort. They think God's got bigger things to deal with than me. Understand this. You are God's biggest deal. You're his prized possession. There's no detail in your life that's too small to concern him. He numbered the hairs on your head. He ordered your days. Whether you like it or not, the Bible says he watches you when you sleep. No nuance of your life is too small to concern him. He wants to be involved. You're saying God cares about what I make on this test? He does. He cares that my car needs repairs? He does. He cares if I get a good night's sleep? He does. If it's important to you, it's important to God. He wants you to bring these things to him. When you call, he answers. When your name comes across his phone, so to speak, he smiles. He says, I'll be right there to help. The Bible tells us to acknowledge God in all our ways. Not just before we eat, but in everything. He made the universe and he made the atom. There's no detail too small to concern him. We don't have to pray in the King James Version like Shakespeare authored it. You can if you want to, but Jesus said, this is your father you're dealing with. When I talk to my dad, I don't say, Greetings, thy senior pastor of Lakewood Church. I request an audience with thee. No, he would think that was odd. When I talk to my dad, I just talk to him. In the same way, prayer is just talking to God. He wants to hear the details. He wants to be involved in your life. You can ask questions. You can express concerns. You can tell him what you're grateful for or what you need help with. When you go to your father, he'll give you wisdom. He'll give you good ideas. He'll give you direction. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to pray a perfect prayer. Like Jesus said, this is your father you're talking to. He already knows what you need. He just wants to hear from you. There are times we feel like we have to convince God to love us. We have to win him to our side. We think maybe if I come to church enough, or if I do more good deeds, then then I'll get some credit with him. The biggest lie that some of us believe is not that God's angry with us, it's that he's indifferent. Thoughts will tell us if we perform better, then we'll get his approval. Then he'll show us favor. But when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the moment he came out of the water, a voice boomed out of the heavens and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What's interesting is up to this point, Jesus hadn't performed a single miracle. He hadn't opened any blind eyes, healed any lepers, raised Lazarus from the dead. He hadn't even turned water to wine. Yet his father said, he's my son and I'm a proud dad. Jesus didn't win God's approval based on his performance. His father was pleased with him because of who he was, not what he had done. We tell ourselves, if I could be more disciplined, if I was more generous, if I only made better choices, then God would be proud. No, the truth is, God is well pleased with you just as you are. You're his beloved son or daughter. There is nothing you could do to make him love you anymore. He might not agree with all your behavior, but he is pleased with who you are. He's already approved you. He's already called you his masterpiece. Why don't you accept right now that God loves you and he's for you based on who he is, not your performance. But thoughts may say, God can't love you like he loves Jesus. He never made any mistakes. You're not like him. You know what you've done. Don't listen to those voices. If there's nothing you could do to make God love you any more, then the good news is there's nothing you could do to make him love you any less. 
When your father looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees someone redeemed, forgiven, transformed by the power of the cross. He doesn't see mistakes and he doesn't see failure. Jesus said, just as the father is pleased with me, so have I loved you. Are we living for God's approval or are we living from it? Are we striving to earn his love or do we recognize we've been given more than we could ever deserve? When I was about nine years old, I had this video game that I loved. I was having the time of my life playing it until one day my mom heard from another mom who heard from another mom that this game was too dark for me to be playing and I wasn't allowed to anymore. I was devastated. So of course, I did what any sanctified, church-going nine-year-old would do, and I hid it in the most secret place that I could think of, the attic behind the hot water heater. Pretty sneaky, or so I thought. A few weeks later, I was in the car with my parents, and out of the blue, my mom asks, did you hide that game I told you not to play? I panicked and said the first words that came to my mind. No. <laughs> Why? She said, because there was a problem with the hot water heater, and it just so happens your game was behind it. My entire life flashed before my eyes. That was the most secret place my nine-year-old brain could think of, and it had been found. I thought, this is the end. I've, I've been caught. I'm going to prison. But right before I could get in trouble, my dad spoke up and said, Victoria. <laughs> Victoria, I told you, he hid the game because if his friends found it and asked to play it, he didn't want to have to tell them no. I don't know if my dad actually believed that or if he was just trying to bail me out. But in that moment, all I did was nod my head in agreement. I had never been so grateful for a second chance. I thought, I've seen the last of this PlayStation. I will never have fun again. But my dad spoke up and took my side despite what I had done. I'm sure he knew why I had hidden the game, but he chose to see the best. He didn't berate me for my wrongs. He showed me what was right. And that's just a funny story, but it can be a reminder of how merciful our Heavenly Father is. He takes our side. He bails us out. He doesn't give us what we deserve. When our mistakes became too much to bear, he said, put the blame on me. I'll take your sin. I'll take your failure. I'll take the stuff you're not proud of. As for you, you can move on. You can be free. You don't have to keep bringing this back up. I've forgotten it. But sometimes we live like we're trying to pay God back for what we've done wrong. We try to show him that we're really sorry by being defeated and discouraged about something that could have happened years ago. We've asked for forgiveness a thousand times, but we just don't feel worthy. That's not the Father's heart. He spoke up on our behalf. He took the penalty so that we didn't have to. We don't have to live beaten down and discouraged after he went to such great lengths to lift us up. The price has been paid. The first time you ask for forgiveness, his mercy comes rushing in. Now we have to receive it and move forward. The reason some people get stuck in a cycle of guilt and condemnation is because they only know God as God not as their father. They think they need to stop this and change that and fix themselves before they could ever get right with God. But the Bible tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace, to obtain mercy and find help, even in our time of need. We won't go boldly to the throne if we think the one sitting on it is waiting to punish us for our sin. But when we know God as our father, we can enter with our head held high, knowing he is rich in mercy and ready to help. It doesn't say come boldly to the throne if you haven't made any mistakes this week, or come after you get your issues figured out. 
No, God wants us to come boldly to him, even when we've messed up. Even on our worst day, we can go to our Father. But most of the time, instead of running to God, we run from him. We think he'll be angry or disappointed. Thoughts will tell us, you can't go to God. You'd be a hypocrite. After all, you knew it was wrong and you did it anyway. God's not going to help you out now. You got yourself in this mess. Those accusing voices will try to draw us further and further from the truth that at the heart of God is mercy. Imagine a father teaching his son to climb a tree. He warns him not to climb it when he's not around because he doesn't want him to get hurt. Then one day, he hears his son shouting for help from outside. He rushes out and sees him hanging from the top branch for dear life. He says, Dad, please help, I'm slipping. This father would not scold his son for climbing the tree on his own. He wouldn't ask to see his report card or if he took the trash out last week. No, this father would do whatever it took to get his son down safely. God is a good father. He's not going to leave you hanging. You may have made the mess, brought the trouble on yourself, but the moment you call out to him, your heavenly father is there to help. He'll climb any tree, scale any wall, bring down any barrier to be at your side. You're his child. There's nothing he wouldn't do for you. When we were at our worst, he loved us. That's the father's heart. Instead of running from God, Let's run to him. In Luke 15, Jesus tells the story of a son who came to his father and said, I want my inheritance, and I want it right now. He packed his bags, moved to some wild city, and had a crazy few weeks. He spent all his money on people and parties and things he thought would last a lot longer than they did. And then a famine hit. And all of a sudden, these new friends seemed to disappear. So he got a job out in the fields feeding pigs. This son found himself hungry and alone in some foreign country. He thought, at least my father's farmhands have better lives than this. Maybe if I go to him and tell him I've been reckless and I don't deserve to be called your son, then he'll take me back as a hired hand. So he gathered what little he had and began his journey home. All the while practicing this speech he had prepared. I've been reckless, and I don't deserve to be called your son. How many times have we disqualified ourselves as a son or daughter as if it was something we earned in the first place? How many times have we written speeches trying to convince God to take us back? That's not how biology works. That's not how God designed it. A son is still a son, no matter how he feels. Amen. A daughter is still a daughter, no matter where she finds herself. It's in the blood. No matter how reckless we've been, we can't undo the power of the blood. This young man hadn't even made it home yet. The Bible says when he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And with his heart pounding, he ran and embraced him. That's the good news. Even when we're a long way off, even when we don't have it all together, even when we're still broken and messed up, our Father comes running. He runs through any mistake or failure. He runs through any disappointment or unfair situation. He runs through any hurt or pain and embraces us as a father. To the people Jesus was talking to, this wouldn't have been a casual gesture. A respected man at the time would have never ran. If he were to run, he would have had to tie up his tunic and expose his legs. In that culture, this would have been humiliating. It would have been seen as shameful and inappropriate. But Jesus tells us, the father did not walk. He didn't wait until he got closer. Jesus said the father ran. It's the only time in the Bible we see a picture of God running. And he's running to someone who had blown it. He's running to someone who had messed up. He was running to his son. 
in doing this, he was saying, I'll take your shame. I'll take your guilt. I don't care what's appropriate. My son is home. My daughter is back when we take one step toward God we'll find he's already running toward us. It doesn't matter how far off we feel, his arms are open wide. But even after all of this, the son still tried to give his speech. He said, but I've been reckless and I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. And I love what verse 22 says. But the father wasn't listening. He didn't have time for regrets. He didn't want to dwell on the past. He was too busy putting a party together. He was already celebrating. For once, his son was lost, but now he's found. That's the love of our Heavenly Father, and that's how he feels about you. Receive his love. Enter his embrace. Know that God is proud of you and you matter so much to Him. Thanks for watching the message. I hope it inspired and uplifted you. Make sure you subscribe to stay connected. There are new messages every week. We love you and we'll see you next time.